Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to our work session. I'll go ahead and call us to order at four o'clock. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Bajan. Here. Clegg. Here. Allie Burton. Here. Sanchez. Here. Thompson. Here. Woodings. Here. All present. Great. Thanks, everybody. All right. First up on the agenda, we have a discussion on our cycle pub ordinance and potential changes. I think Craig will kick us off. Oh, great. Sorry about that, Council President Pro Tem. Go ahead. That's okay. Thank you. Um, so several months ago, we started the process of responding to a lot of concerns from citizens and downtown businesses about the operations of bike bars in um, downtown Boise. And obviously, during COVID, it's been difficult, if not completely impossible, to safely operate them downtown. So it's given us a little bit of breathing a little bit of breathing room. So several months ago, we had a work session around some potential changes um, to the bike bars. But at that time, we hadn't had any um, industry involvement yet. And I think that just as good practice, we should always involve the folks that will be impacted by ordinance changes while we're developing changes to those ordinances. Um, so in the time between that work session when we sort of had a discussion as council and um, now we have been contacted by um, an attorney who's representing a, at least a couple bike bar operators and um, other bike bar operators wanting to come to us and address some of the concerns that we've been seeing from um, those downtown businesses and residents and citizens in maybe a way that will still allow them to operate um, in, a, in a more, um, I guess, compatible way with other uses downtown. So that's what today's work session is about. I think Craig's gonna kick us off by reminding us what we talked about last time, kind of some of the potential solutions we came up with. We're gonna hear from, um, I think at least a couple of folks that are bike bar operators and um, some people representing them with some other potential solutions. And then we'll follow that up with a discussion on council on how we want to go forward. So um, thanks for letting me kick that off. And I think that now I get to kick it to Craig. All right. Thank you, Councilmember Woodings. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council for having me here today. Um, we're back to speak about the bike bar industry and some of the changes that we proposed before and I'm just gonna briefly go over the presentation that I did and get some of the things on the record. So I'll go through that now. Um, I'd like to present a brief overview, just some history and some of the challenges that we've had here in Boise over the last eight years. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the direction after the last work session. And then uh, we'll also hear from the stakeholders today as well. And then uh, at the end of the meeting, we'll take any direction and, and next steps accordingly from mayor and council. As you know, um, from the last presentation in 2012 was the first year that we actually had bike bars in Boise. During that time, I think it's important to note that no alcohol were allowed on the bike bars at that time. And we had very little uh, complaints from the community as well. In 2013, the, the bike bar industry approached the city, asked that uh, allow, alcohol be allowed on the bars, on the bike bars themselves. However, we couldn't license those bike bars. Uh, for alcohol di distribution, but they were allowed to operate similar to a limousine and where somebody could bring their own beer, bring their own wine, and then consume that as long as they were on the, the bike bar itself. 
we made the appropriate uh, code changes. And uh, from 2013 to present, we've seen a growth in the industry as well as uh, an additional business and several other trips as well as several other vehicles in downtown Boise as well. Uh, some of the challenges that we've faced, uh, the downtown businesses, we've, we've really looked at those complaints and we compartmentalize those complaints into these categories. Uh, mainly the downtown businesses where we received a, a lot of complaints as well as from the bars themselves. Uh, downtown patrons that were enjoying our, our patio dining, uh, there was a lot of complaints from citizens that were uh, felt like they were choked out with noise uh, when they're trying to enjoy a dinner in downtown. We also heard from our residents, our resident population in downtown Boise has really expanded over the last several years. And they were uh, also uh, very vocal about the bike bars. Uh, DBA was also involved with this as well as Boise police. Uh, DBA heard so many complaints that they did an <coughs> informal survey and then brought those results back to uh, Boise police and the clerk's office. And we discussed those. When we looked at the complaints in general, we, we compartmentalized those into four uh, categories, excessive noise being the most prevalent complaint, uh, as well as the dis drunken disorderly conduct that was being uh, observed in the community. There was also traffic impacts as well as uh, other miscellaneous things like public urination, uh, vomiting. Um, we, we had parking issues uh, and a myriad of other, other complaints as well. At the end of the uh, last work session, we, um, we gave council like three different options to consider. They, uh, the, the approach was to take a multifaceted approach. We were asked to go back and work with our legal team to eliminate amplified sound, prohibit alcohol consumption on the, uh, on the vehicles themselves, and then limit the hours of operation. Uh, those obviously took code amendments. Uh, we worked with our legal team. We did uh, some general code cleanup uh, we also address the two specific areas in city code that allows uh, open container uh, and also the commercial vehicle code would have to be amended as well. Uh, we were also asked to do stakeholder outreach at that time that we visited with the stakeholders. Um, they asked that we would postpone the public hearing and that's kind of why we're here today. Uh, council heard that and, and mayor's office heard that and rescheduled it for today instead of October 6th. During that stakeholder outreach, I think it's important to note that we mentioned some of the challenges that we'd worked on with the industry over the last several years. A lot of those uh, challenges were addressed on multiple occasions, both by my office and also with the Boise Police Department. The, the complaints might subside a little bit, but then they would always come back. And so our recommendation is still the same today to, you know, if we wanna address and mitigate these problems, we're gonna have to probably do that through some aggressive code changes. Madam Mayor. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Craig, didn't we also talk about um, perhaps limiting certain routes to bike bars um, among your list of things? I just want to make sure we got everything on the table so as we talk tonight, people know what, what Madam Mayor, is. Council Member Clegg, yes, we did. And those can be addressed specifically with the license. We can stipulate those accordingly, but we, you're right. We did, we did discuss that as a, another potential option as well. Thank you. You bet. Um, so today you're going to hear from the stakeholders during the stakeholder discussions. We also heard that, you know, this is some of these code changes could potentially cripple their operations. I'm sure you're going to hear that from the industry today. Um, there was also discussions about being singled out with noise, particularly how do we address noise with Harley Davidson's that run downtown versus bike bars. And the answer to that was we have a noise ordinance and we also have a muffler ordinance in place to address some of those concerns. But you're gonna hear some alternatives, I think, from the bike bar industry. And uh, you know we welcome those. We always wanna work with the industry as well. Um, at the end of this, the, the representatives will have, we told them five to 10 minutes. We wanna, in the interest of time today, so the council has a, enough time to deliberate and make some, some good decisions here. Um, once those uh, decisions are made, uh, council can give us direction. We can make alternative code amendments if need be. If so, uh, three readings will still be needed at that time, as well as a uh, public hearing could be done, but it is optional since there's no fees involved and that will be up to the council and mayor's discretion. And then once we get that input, we can set the timeline accordingly. So 
Thank you, and I will stand for any further questions. Looks like we're good, Craig. Thank okay. you. All right, so I'm not sure the order who's here. Council President Pro Tem. Do you have something in mind? Um, Madam Mayor, I, I believe that Craig sent me kind of a proposed um, run of show and I can't remember exactly what was on that. So maybe he can refresh our memory. Yeah. So we have, we have representation today from the uh, both, both the uh, Petals and Pints and the, uh, not Boise Bike Bar, but uh, uh, Petals and Pints and Boise Buzz Bike. So, uh, Anthony, are you? PowerPoint that you sent me out there. I did not receive a PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, well, we sent it to Jamie, but that's okay. I can. Uh, I can just. Powerful. Yeah, just point yeah. powerfully. Yes, exactly. Okay. If right. that's fine with you all, I we sent it to Jamie, and she said it would be uploaded, and someone would operate it for us. Since, but I didn't. I didn't get that from. Jamie at all, so but my apologies. Right. Is it possible for us to send a PowerPoint to Craig? I mean, yeah. we were under the impression that we were able to present the visual presentation for the council. I don't think- Sure, yeah, time. if you can, if it's possible for you to email yeah. it, it's there's no reason yeah. not to. Okay, great, yeah. can you forward that to Craig? Sorry about that. Madam Mayor. Council Member Holly Burton. Yes. Um, I guess maybe I do have a question for staff as they're figuring that out. Um, it was noted that uh, that the bikes were bike bars were approved and for a while there was no alcohol allowed on them. Did they operate at all during that time or were they simply approved? And then before they actually hit the streets were things changed in 2013 where alcohol began being allowed on? I can address that, Madam Mayor. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Council Member Halliburton, yes, they did. They, they operated that entire summer season in 2012. Two of the businesses uh, actually operated without alcohol during that time. Perfect, thank you. Yep. Did all of the parties involved have PowerPoints or just the attorneys? So I'm gonna propose if there's somebody else that was invited by the council president pro contempt to speak that you come on up and speak while they're doing the technical stuff because we've got half an hour more for this item. So who, who is that? Or is it just everybody has counsel here? Madam Mayor, as mentioned, uh, we represent, I, of course, I'm Anthony Shallot for uh, Boise Buzz bike and thousand pints. Um, we had allocated 10 minutes for a presentation by council and also one to two minutes uh, for each uh, bike owner to talk about them, you know, what their issues are and, sure. and just to address the council directly. If there's a little bit of lag time, I don't know if there is right now. I think the, uh, the owners of the bike cars can say. Yeah, minutes. if they're here to say a couple of things, I think that's a good way to get through, get through that while they're uploading the presentation. Sure. I think we can kick it off then with uh, Brady Olson from Boise Buzz Bike. Um, you have about two minutes to, to address the council, Brady. Yeah. Great, thank you. Hi, Brady. Hi, uh, thank you for uh, being here today and thanks for giving me a minute to speak in regards to this. Um, like Anthony said, my I'm sorry, <laughs> That's, could you just, I think out of, I think even though this is a work session, we need it. In public hearings, we ask people to give their name and address for the record. And this is a little different because it's a work session, but we should probably have that. Yeah, my name is Brady Olson and I'm the founder of Boise Buzz Bike. And your address? Um, my, my. Either, whatever you're comfortable giving, we just need something in the My morning. home address? Is or your work asking. address, whatever you uh, like. It's 11026 West Eustick, um, number 104. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, like I said, uh, thank you for letting me speak today. Um, my name is Brady Olson once again, and I am born and raised here in Idaho. I've lived in Boise for the last 15 years, 
And throughout my time here, I have became personally connected, invested in the community. I would just like to say, unfortunately, I think there are some assumptions um, through others in the community that uh, spike bar companies don't care about the well-being of, of downtown Boise and that we are here to maybe take advantage of downtown Boise for our benefit. Um, and I would just like to state that I think quite the contrary. I think that, as you may all know, that bike bars have become very popular across the nation. It's not just unique to Boise. And I think one of the big benefits that they offer downtown communities um, is to the economy. We offer a unique tourism experience that kind of encompasses all of downtown Boise as a whole and collectively. And many of our customers do not reside in the downtown Boise area, whether they are from Nampa or California. Um, it is continuously expressed to me that they are downtown for the bike bar and that they are downtown on that particular day having meals before and after the bike bar downtown establishments, that they are purchasing alcoholic and non-alcoholic drinks from downtown establishments during, before and after the bike bar. Um, and for a, a, a large customer base we have that are not from Boise as a whole, they are staying in hotels in the downtown area um, to be kind of around the bike bar and, and where we operate. I uh, would like to just express that I do care about the community very much and I want to come, I'm very willing and I think all of us are very willing to work with the city to provide the best experience for everybody involved. Um, and we uh, welcome the responsibility of being a, a positive contributing factor to downtown and Boise, Idaho as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Time. All right, it sounds like the presentation's ready. So now we'll go back to council and then we'll hear from the rest of you at the end. And I can change slides, just let me know when you wanna. Okay, wonderful. Well, Madam Mayor and members of City Council, I wanna thank you. My name is Josh Scholler um, and I, my address is 1116 East Washington Street, Boise 3712. And on behalf of Fisher Hudson Shallot and our clients here today, Boise Buzz Bike and Pedals and Pints, I wanna thank you for having us here. And uh, I wanna especially thank uh, Council President Pro Tem Woodings for her working with us um, in this regard to help make this work session happen and postpone um, this uh, from October 6th so that we could do this together today. Um, in the interest of time, I kind of want to get into what we're all here to discuss. Um, and I, I will say I had a slide prepped up to how we got here and has kind of the set in the uh, the ground, the front uh, that we're here, and but Craig did that wonderfully for me. So I will kind of just skip through that part about how you guys heard. Um, but I will say that I guess we summarize, you know, these litany of issues that Mr. Croner validly, very valid issues um, into three separate issues, um, kind of broadly speaking, and that's traffic, hours of operation, um, noise, and then public safety and public intoxication. And so, uh, in, in light of that now, I kind of want to say that a really important part of why we are here today is to establish, we hope, a uniform set of regulations that will protect Boiseans and allow the industry, our clients, to continue for all of those who are in the downtown space. Um, and we believe this is particularly important given that not all bike bars are operated and managed equally. Um, and the, in formalizing many of these requirements that we are proposing to you today, um, and some of these that our clients already self-imposed will go a long way to achieving that. Um, so this, before I get right into the proposed regulations, this is just some examples that we have found from other um, cities. And then the one on the bottom right is from a internal policy um, from a Minneapolis where they, where they limit drinks to two to three per person. Um, and as you'll see later, that's something that we're gonna propose, but a lot of this, and as you'll see, is very generic and very broad language that I think um, a lot of cities have begun work on this. But I think, as you'll find out, and as I would say, this is really an opportunity for the city of Boise to lead on this area of regulations, being specific common sense regulations that are going to, um, you know, work for folks who want to enjoy their meals downtown, but and then also folks who may be out of town or people who are, as Brady mentioned, you know, 
doing dinner before and after a bike bar. Um, we think that these regulations that we're going to propose are going to be common sense regulations that's really going to allow Boise to take the lead on this um, nationally. So to that end, like I said, three areas where we're proposing traffic congestion, hours of operation, noise, and then public intoxication and public safety. So first, and as you all know, and as Mr. Croner stated just now and in August, one of the chief concerns of folks in Boise is the traffic. Um, there's nothing worse than, you know, after a long day going down Capitol Boulevard at 4.30 in the afternoon and getting stuck behind a bike bar and that's going slow. And, and Capitol Boulevard being a, without a bike bar is already slow enough between 4.30 and 6.30. And so there's also been a couple of complaints that passed along to us regarding bike bars entering neighborhoods with, you know, kind of a robust local commercial presence. Think Hyde Park here. Um, and then finally, we've heard issues about bike bars being on what is usually always a busy street, um, which further adds to the congestion and the need, as um, Council President Clegg mentioned, the, draft, the, the need to draft out zones and routes for bike bars. And so to alleviate this pressure, we are proposing the same changes here um, that was outlined in the first draft of the changes made by city staff. Um, and that's no operation of bike bars uh, between 4.30 and 6.30, uh, Monday through Friday and then um, in the downtown corridor and then cut off time every day of 1030. And then also um, to that third part, we are also, or sorry, the second part we would like to suggest a, whether it's statutory or a ban on operation of bike bars in any of the primary residential zones, such as Hyde Park, such as any of those places that may have like a commercial presence, but are still primarily living spaces. Um, and then finally, I think we can all agree that there's probably just some streets that bike bars shouldn't be on. We're talking front, Myrtle, Eighth, stuff like that. Where, um, and so to that end, we are proposing working with city staff to come up with specific routes and or zones that bike bars ought to stay or follow. Um, and so that the expectation is clear for all bike bars and all present and future um, for folks so they know what expect the expectations are. Um, the next, and I think this is something we can all certainly understand and, and, and sympathize with um, is the issue of noise. And, you know, we'll continue to attest and, and we will say that, you know, um, music, being able to be in a bike bar and listen to music and enjoy yourselves is critical to the bike bar experience. And if we were to ban music, I, we really would say that it would be a, um, a business killer for us. Um, however, I will note that one of our clients has already taken the initiative and all of the speakers that they use are capped at a certain decibel level. I believe it's 80 decibels and it, can, it cannot go far, like it cannot go increase beyond that. Um, and so to this end, we are proposing a statutory cap on the decibel level that can be produced by bike bars. Um, and this can be achieved through a variety of ways, but um, maybe prior to a licensing or something like that, you need to show that you have uh, an amplified sound system that is that you can cap the amount of sound coming out of it. And I don't know about you all, but I had no idea about like what exactly <laughs> 70 decibels versus 60 decibels versus 100 decibels. And so I did some quick Googling and Yale's Department of Health and Safety says that a chainsaw is about 110 decibels. Standard city traffic sits at about 85. The vacuum is about 75. And then normal conversation can range anywhere between 60 and 70. So just kind of give you a sense of what that would be like. Um, so then moving on to what I think is clearly the most substantive, but also what I believe the most important set of proposed regulations that we're bringing to you today is regarding public intoxication and public safety. Um, I'll address each of them just briefly um, and the purpose behind them. And so the first we have is mandatory tips training for all bike bar drivers. Tips, which is something that I think the city and the state both use. Um, is a skills-based training program designed to prevent intoxication, underage drinking, and drunk driving, and trains individuals, and what we are hoping to be bike bar drivers and owners in responsible service sale and consumption of alcohol. Now, obviously, we're not proposing licensing and allowing them to serve alcohol, but a lot of this training is knowing when someone is too drunk or knowing if they, if they show up, whether they're too inebriated to go on a bike bar. Um, and that's what we're proposing for this chain or for the tips training. And then next we are proposing to limit bike bar tours to an hour and a half. In August, you all heard about uh, a lot of valid public safety issues from Mr. Croner. And when we spoke with our clients and then city staff shortly thereafter, they agreed that these issues do in fact happen. However, what they noted is that almost every single time it happens in that last half hour of bike bar tours. And so that's why today we are, you know, in that first hour and a half, a lot of our clients, customers have a blast. They have fun. They, they aren't 
you know, you know, it <laughs> running off and you know, urinating in public or stuff like that, that is, is obviously not okay. And so that's why we have proposed this uh, strict hour and a half ride time uh, regulation. And then next, we are also proposing a similar regulation to what we've seen in other bike bars and what I had talked about earlier. And that's that three drink limit per person on the bike bar. And that can be something that is strictly enforced by the, by the bike bar owners. If you bring four, if you bring five, if you bring you know, whatever, one even drink over, then you don't get to go. And I'll talk a little bit more into that, the strict user ride agreements at the end, but uh, we are proposing a three drink limit uh, because effect, you know, if, you, if you just completely ban alcohol, we would argue um, that that would effectively kill our client's business. And so empowering our bike bar drivers to limit the amount of alcohol will allow our clients, customers to still be able to enjoy themselves without giving an opportunity for things to get out of control. Um, so, next um, question, how do you ensure, how do you propose that um, that be enforced or, or the owners of the bike bars be held accountable? I'm just thinking about what that means for like a staffing yeah. and honestly a, a cost of licensure. Right. Yeah. Madam Mayor, I think that's a great question. And I think what I will, I'll actually skip to the last part there because I think that'll answer the question better. Um, you know, in terms of writing it in statute, I think it's pretty, um, we can relate it to licensure. I'm not sure exactly how that would work, but I think we can, it's, it's twofold. I think in my mind, on one hand, it's um, a, a statutory prohibition and tying it to licensure, but then also a really strict user right agreement. I think a lot of the times what we've talked about with our clients is if people show up, um, you know, we can say you're going to be like, we're going to make, we're counting how much, how many drinks you have. We're counting, we're making sure you're not inebriated before even going on the bike bars. Obviously there will be some accountability that will have to happen on, on terms of the bike bar owners, but um, that's something that they can easily write into their agreements. So that if you show up with more than three per person, uh, then you don't get to go on the bike and you don't get your money back and you don't, this is something that's very clear on the outset that when they're signing this, um, this is the expectation. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, and so I think, Madam Mayor. I, yeah, go ahead. So I just have a follow up question to that. So uh, when folks uh, are riding on the bike bar, is it strangers or is it one group that tends to do this? Uh, um, Council Member Sanchez and Madam Mayor, I um, having I've, I've been on a bike bar once and it was. Um, as far as I can know, and I might just have Brady attest to this, but I, when I did it, it was a group of us that all signed up in advance. Um, so everyone knew each other, but I don't know if Brady wants to. Okay, so yeah, I, they don't, I don't think they're picking up anyone off the street or anything okay. like that. The, the reason I'm asking is because I think um, in other situations, you have the ability to test to see if somebody is following the rules. It's a little bit harder when it's a group coming together. So I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. I, and then just to finish up here, um, I know there was an issue of public urination, which is something we think is very valid as well. And um, something that we are requiring is, I think in a lot of this, uh, Madam Mayor, you hit on it quite well, is a lot of this can be tied to licensure for accountability purposes. Um, and that's a requirement of outhouses at the beginning and the end of bike bar routes. Um, one of our clients does this already. And so, um, that's what I have for you. And just to wrap up, you know, I want to say that this is certainly not all encompassing. And I know that you all will have your own ideas and, and stuff that we can um, contemplate together. But I really think that we have presented a pretty robust set of regulations that will address a lot of the issues um, if, you know, that the public has voiced, as well as some of the, pay, the public safety issues that we see while continuing to allow Boiseans and non Boiseans and, and everyone to enjoy the bike bars in a way that allows people to enjoy their dinner downtown and enjoy their time on the bike bars as well. So I'm happy to answer any further questions that you may have or any, anything else. Madam Mayor. Um, thank you, Josh. I'll put this question out here so um, others um, might answer it. I um, know that the bike bars sometimes stop at, at bars. And so if you have a three drink limit, is that on board? And will patrons still be able to buy a drink uh, at those stops? Yeah, uh, Council President Clegg and Madam Mayor, I, I, I think that that's something that um, in terms of what we are proposing, it would be a three drink limit because right now it's bring your own. And so what we are saying is you are limited to three that you bring by yourself. Um, and you're right, they do stop at the, the bars, but um, 
I, so I guess to answer your question, what we are proposing is a three drink limit of what you bring yourself. Okay. Um, you know, there, there are, are different ways I think we could do it, that if people are bringing their drinks, then there's limited to where you can stop in terms of like drafting the zones and the ordinance. Um, yeah. I, think, I think it's flexible in that regard, okay. uh, for sure. Um, but what we are proposing is just that when you're bringing your own alcohol onto the bike bar is a three drink limit. Thank you. That's the, the one thing I, I see in your proposal that I just was unsure how it would work. Appreciate that. Madam Mayor, this is TJ. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, thank you, uh, Josh. I can tell there's been a lot of uh, good thought that's gone into these um, ideas and concepts. One thought that came to mind um, in terms of the limit on uh, three, the limit of three, you, I can think of quite a bit of variation in uh, a size of a can that you could purchase. I, you know, buy a pretty large uh, three pack of IPAs. Um, but is, is there, have you put some thought into as well, maybe like uh, three 12 ounce uh, cans or 12 ounce uh, uh, wines or whatever, um, but, cause it, it could be pretty dramatic differences there. Absolutely, uh, Council Member Thompson and uh, Madam Mayor, I, I think that there is something that we were discussing absolutely. And I think other cities have looked at this as well. Um, in terms of, and I think as far as I'm concerned, that's a pretty easy um, statutory uh, mandate, I guess, but a, a requirement that you can, um, of bike bar owners that, um, you know, the alcohol that's brought on board of these vehicles has to be, you know, a, a 12 ounce, you know, uh, I, there's one city and it's escaping me um, that does limit it to um, light beers, uh, whatever the encompassing of that under that umbrella. Um, but it does limit it to that. And so that would be a requirement for the bike bar owners to ensure that people aren't bringing IPAs and, and stuff like, you know, very large cans like you alluded to. So I think that would be a, a relatively easy requirement to impose on the bike bars. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, thanks, Josh. I, my main set of questions has to do with how all of this works because um, my understanding is that the reason that we're here is, yeah, you know, the complaints didn't start in 2018, like your first slide said, this, the complaint started in 2013. And what we heard from staff is, you know, we have an upswelling of complaints and problems and issues. We all have a sit down and a talk. We try to deal with it. It goes away for six months and it's back. And what we heard from staff is we're incredibly frustrated because this isn't working. So we already have an ordinance against public urination. We have a noise ordinance. We have drunk and disorderly conduct ordinances. And what staff has told us is we need, you know, we need to revise this industry in significant ways because these ordinances aren't working. And then your presentation is a list of more detailed, more complicated, more nuanced, more fine grained rules for people to follow. Um, and the, the thematic issue here is that we haven't had good success following the rules we have. So I guess the question is, uh, how how is more rules the solution? Well, uh, Councilmember Bajan, I, I will. Yeah, I'll let that. I'll let Tony answer that question. Madam Mayor, Councilmember, um, I think you make a good point. Uh, you know that there has been complaints. Um, you know, and perhaps you know they've gradually increased uh, since 2018. But I want to emphasize that there hasn't been any regulation of the bike bar industry outside of code. We're simply trying to take um, no regulation of the bike bar industry right now uh, and propose some common sense measures that are gonna address some of the concerns rather than just simply you know, banning the bike bars outright or banning alcohol right now. There hasn't been this a half um, gap or a stop gap measure thus far um, that I think you know, we have an opportunity to you know, at least try something to you know, keep the industry alive um, address some of these concerns uh, without going ahead and banning alcohol or music from the bike bar. So since 2013, when bike bars were allowed to bring alcohol on, there hasn't been any fine tuning of this regulation, you know, this ordinance. So I think this is an opportunity to do that. Thank you. Uh, follow up, Madam Mayor. I mean, that, at the point was, you're, I mean, you're right, that there hasn't been any fine tuned regulation, but the, the point I was trying to get at is, um, we're having difficulties with industry, this industry following the laws that apply to everybody. Sure. And so I'm, I'm curious as to why adding more rules helps. Well, the, the laws that apply to everyone apply to everyone regardless. You know, since 2013, you know, the city council went out on a, a bold limb 
decided to allow alcohol on the bike bars. Um, and I believe, you know, since 2013, there has been an influx of bike bars uh, into this area. Uh, and perhaps, um, you know, the answer isn't banning alcohol on the bike bars, but limiting them out of the bike bars on the streets, uh, proposing different routes so people are disturbed during their dinner, uh, and addressing some of the real concerns regarding over intoxication. I also want to bring up, you know, so I'm going to jump in here because I have to go to parent teacher conferences. Um, but one question I would love to have you address for everybody else to then fill me in is why it's taking us to get into your business about the size of can, how many cans, all that, if there have been impacts that our city staff and clerk's office have come to you about before. So regulation of impact versus regulation of action. And I'm just curious why bike bars haven't addressed this stuff in their own operating plans um, prior to having us have to deal with the impacts that are really real to businesses downtown. So if you'd address that as part of your time, I'll find out the answer okay. from when I'm back. It was great to see you all. Thank you, and Madam now Mayor. I get to go hear hopefully that Aiden is doing okay on <laughs> online class. I, 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 I'm gonna defer um, part of that answer to one of my clients, but I know there has been regulation in the industry. Uh, that being said, um, you know, without any statutory uh, regulations um, of the bike bar, you know, there have been a lot of people who have been uh, allowed to, you know, operate to the limits of what's uh, socially acceptable. Um, and I, I believe, you know, a lot of bike bars have tried to self-regulate, um, but, you know, there's a difference between someone suggesting self-regulation uh, and the city mandating that. And not only is that important for bike bars, but that's also important for patrons of bike bars. If the patrons of the bike bars know that, you know, it's against the law you know, to do something, uh, then that gives the bike bars a little bit more power. Uh, you know, if the patrons of the, you know, the set of the bike bar owner saying, okay, well, this is our suggestion only, you can only have one or two drinks on the bike bar, um, you know, that someone might ignore that. Uh, but if, you know, a bike bar owner says, here's the law, you can only have one or two drinks on the bike bar. You can only, you know, you can only urinate in these um, porta potties. You can't go ahead and, you know, you use the, the restaurants of the bars that urinate. Uh, you know, you have these certain requirements of the bike bars. I mean, we're empowering the bike bars. Uh, and I think it's important, you know, to try to find some sort of half gap measure without eliminating, you know, an entire industry and at least give that a shot and, you know, see if that changes. You mean, the city council always has the ability to go back and impose strict regulations, but everything Josh presented, um, the proposed routes, the amplified sound, uh, the limits of drinks, these are suggestions in order to meet, um, you know, the city halfway and address some of these real concerns. Um, I'm happy to answer any other questions, but if there's no other, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, one of the bike bar owners. Madam President. Any other questions? Madam President, it's uh, Council Member Holly Burton. Who was that? Jimmy? Jimmy? Oh, okay. There you go. Sorry. Uh, since I couldn't see you, I couldn't quite tell who it was. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I turned my video off. It's breaking up a little bit. Um, a question, and, and then I've got a follow up afterward. How many bars are you typically stopping to during your, your period of time that you're on the bike bar? I'm going to defer to uh, one of the bike bar owners, but if you want to ask your follow up question, um, if that relates to some sort of legal mechanism or what we're proposing, I can answer that. Otherwise, we'll turn it over to uh, Mike Thompson. Sure, um, I can do the follow up question now and then perhaps either or him and or you could answer that. So my question is, is that depending on how many bike bars that you're going to um, or how many bars you're actually stopping at. So if you're having three drinks on the bar and you're stopping at three areas in between, you know, that's six alcoholic beverages in about an hour and a half period of time. And so I don't know that the problem that we've identified so far is that there's necessarily too much alcohol being served on the bike bar itself. It's that there's too much alcohol being served to the people. And then they're riding around the city on the bike bar. And that's where some of that behavior is happening. And so I guess that that's my, my curiosity is it doesn't necessarily to me seem like limiting the drinks on the bike bar necessarily solves the problem. If people are coming with already having one or, or two or three drinks and then continuing to go into bars and then getting back on the bike bar. So I, I guess I'm curious how the, the limiting of the drinks solves the drunken and disorderly conduct on the bike bar itself. 
Um, Council Member Hallie Burton, uh, I think you make up, you, you uh, put some, some good points forth. Uh, and I wanna say that we've addressed that in different fashions. Uh, for, first of all, um, you know, you can, the city council has the option of uh, ensuring that it's within statutory code that no one uh, can ride a bike bar if they're intoxicated, number one. You know, someone shows up to a bike bar, they're intoxicated, the owners have a duty to follow the law by not making sure they get on the bike. Number two, limiting the amount of tours uh, and it naturally allows um, or naturally prohibits the amount of bars that the bike bar can stop at. If you have a 60 minute, a 75 minute, a 90 minute tour, you know, that's gonna be a substantially less amount of bars um, a bike bar can stop at. Um, you know, 90 minutes is a suggestion. I think um, if the council is unhappy with a 90 minute tour, 75 minute tour allows, you know, the bike bar to go around downtown three times maybe make one or two stops at bars, uh, things of that nature. Um, third, you know, rarely bringing alcohol on the bikes, you know, that is a contributing factor. Obviously, someone goes to a bar and they take a bunch of shots and they come back, back uh, on the bike bar, you know, then they're going to be intoxicated. Perhaps they shouldn't be a bike bar. Well, at that point, because, you know, the bike bar drivers um, have uh, taken tips training uh, and it's very clear that not only is it um, prohibited by their user agreement, but also prohibited by law for them to uh, stop serving the patrons, uh, the, the tour can end right there. Um, I think it's important that we empower bike bar owners um, to, uh, you know, take a little bit more responsibility uh, and perhaps encouraging them to take, and requiring them to take a little bit more responsibility, um, you know, by allowing us to institute a variety of different measures, including limiting the tours, which I think is going to naturally uh, limit the amount of public intoxication. Um, yeah, thank you for that, outlining those a little bit more. Did, did that answer your question, um, Council Member Halley Burton? Yes, it did. Thank you for outlining those. All right, I'll thank turn you. I'll turn it over to Mike. Ma Madam President, oh, nobody actually sorry. answered the mayor's question. Um, <laughs> and I know she's gonna go review the tapes and she wanted the answer to why, uh, why is it that we need to regulate your business, how many cans of what kind of thing is aboard what bike bar on what street at what time when the problem we're trying to address is the effects in the community and the complaints the community has had. In other words, um, why hasn't your industry taken it upon itself to self mitigate the impacts that it's having on other businesses on other people trying to enjoy downtown, the, uh, those things. And you know, why is it that we now need to create a big sure. set of rules internal to your operation? Uh, I believe Mike, uh, can address that, but I would propose, you know, that that's, that's part of the, the duty um, of the council and the mayor is to impose regulations, you know, on specific industries, whether it's a bike bar, a bar, a restaurant, you know, or other, some other type of industry and make sure they operate responsibly. Go ahead. I thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Michael Thomas. I live at 10394 West Jerry Peak Drive in Boise. Uh, I was the original bike bar owner. Um, and I'll address that question first, Councilman Badgett. Uh, I've been forthcoming with uh, Mr. Croner and Jamie Heinzerling and the police officers in the city when I'm out and about driving the bikes, consistently and constantly asking as a best practice, is there anything I need to be aware of? Is there anything that we are doing that is coming up in your meetings or have you spoken to the police or has the police um, spoken to you about any challenges or instances that we may have uh, created problems for ourselves and for the community. Those answers only come when I ask them. And because I'm consistent about it, I have met with Craig several times and we've discussed certain things, but that hasn't been forthcoming from the city or the police or, or the council. And so it's, it's sort of it's sort of left upon my shoulders to find that out. And I'm happy to do so. And I'm happy to take responsibility for that. But if nobody is telling us that there are complaints, we cannot uh, act against something that's invisible and potentially harming our business and harming our community, which is absolutely the last thing that we want to do. Uh, I started this business because I thought it was going to be fun. It would be something that myself and my friends and family would like to do. And for the first two years that we were in operation, 2011, 2012, prior to being licensed with alcohol, uh, we did run without. And we ran maybe 10 to 15 tours a year. So it wasn't a lot of tours. It was very little impact on downtown. And the bikes were rickety and 
I mean, they were terrible. They were cut in half and shipped here from Europe and we tried to put them back together as best we could. It was, it was really bad. Um, but, but the point being is as the city grew and the population grew, these problems tend to compound themselves just like anything. And so I think with the regulations that we proposed, you can only go around downtown so many times at seven to 10 miles an hour. And you're only going to pass by so many, this is to answer Councilman Halliburton's question, you're only pass by so many bars in that, in that time frame. And so if we limited it to two 12 ounce cans of alcohol, not to exceed 5%, or something like that. I think the percentage of alcohol is key because you have wine that's a higher percentage than beer or Coors Light, let's say is like virtually nothing. And so if we monitor that, keep in mind, we've been keeping hard alcohol off of our bikes this entire time for 10, nine years. We've been in charge of managing that people do not show up because we don't wanna be ticketed. We don't wanna cause dangerous situations and we don't wanna see people overserved. So when somebody comes out of a bar and they may have just tossed back six shots, within five minutes, we're gonna know exactly how much that person has had to drink. And that's the time that we pull over and we excuse everyone from the bike because we don't want the liability either. We don't want anybody to get hurt. And we certainly don't want to cause a ruckus downtown any more than we already do. But um, I, I hope that that answers those two questions. Um, back in 2012, when the second bike bar company came on, uh, it was notated that no alcohol was allowed. However, I was the only company who was operating legally at that time. Even on the website of that company, which has now since been changed, I probably have screenshots of it somewhere. They said that if you put your alcohol in a red solo cup, that it's legal. That's asinine to me. And I had reported that to Mr. Croner. I reported that to Jamie Heinzerling. I am, I, and I operated that way too. And I lost business because of it. People would call me and say, well, you're both the right price. Why is it that I should go with your company? And I had my elevator speech and they would say, well, they allow alcohol. And I'd say, well, they're not legally operating them. And I'm sorry, but we're not going to do that. And so I've held the line and I've also implemented things like the porta potties and I'm happy to pay for more. In fact, I've been paying for one for nine months. That's down where we start and it's still sitting there. Uh, I pay for it every month. And that was because I had heard that there were complaints from uh, neighbors near our starting location that there was public uh, urination. That did not come from the Boise police. That did not come from Mr. Croner, and it didn't come from Mrs. Heinzerling. I did that because I heard about it. And this is my city too, and I care about it. I spend time downtown. My kids live here. There are other businesses that I don't like here, but I don't go around talking about those things or explaining to them why that my children are facing, you know, the new hustler store next to the freeway. So I feel like if I were to take a step back and all things being equal, I have self-regulated far more than I've been asked to. And I will continue to because I love this business and I love this city and I love the faces of the people on my bikes when they get on and they cannot believe what they're riding. Like they've never seen anything like it. And the joy that comes from it and our positive reviews and whatnot, I'll continue to self-regulate, but I am all for further regulation of this business simply because I can see what happens when things go off the rails. I've been there. I've shut people down. I've kicked people off my bikes. I pedaled Holly's tour when she rode back in 2012. I pedaled that bike by myself from Hyde Park back to Payette Brewing because she got off and forgot that she had to pedal back. Sorry, <laughs> but it's true. And so, you know, she never heard from me ever again after that. And of course she had a great time up there, but um, I think the idea is we are here banding together to try and protect something that we've worked very hard to build, but also um, that we care too. And so I just want to touch on a couple more things. Um, we've grown by about 20% per year uh, year over year with uh, almost 300% growth in the last three years. That's exceptional by any standards, I think. Um, this should make a clear statement as to the demand in the Valley and the demand from people coming here uh, who want to do it, who see it, who book with us the very next day that they see it. Ever since this process started, I've heard about how some folks don't see the value of business like ours. In response to that, I'd offer these numbers. Last year, we served 15,000 people here, some local, some out of state. Our max capacity just two days a week right now is uh, driving $10,000 of revenue through the doors of the bars and breweries every weekend. Have I had my fair share of calls from people who said, hey, 
you had drunk people in there and we, we leave our drivers typically on the bike to protect people's personal things uh, while they're in there. But yeah, I've gotten those phone calls and I've decided that those places were a hard black X. We don't go there anymore. We don't want to cause any more problems. And we respected those who don't want us there no matter what, but that's every weekend. And that's just two days a week. And we run six, seven days a week. So you could imagine the multiple of that number, that's over $400,000 in revenue, which is more than I generate by far from my own business for those downtown and certainly those that need it right now, those bars and restaurants that haven't had us patroning their, their businesses. We also donate between 20 and 30 tours annually at a cost to our business of between $10,000 and $17,000 uh, $17, a year, which are then auctioned off at local schools, shelters, nonprofits, and hospitals generating three to five times that amount for these institutions. So to say that our local businesses don't benefit the community and are characterized as a nuisance by a stall, small number of people as compared to the percentage of people who are actually riding our tours is a bit short-sighted, I would say, and maybe even ignorant, but that's okay because we don't all understand the can, nuances of everyone's can business I here. Can I ask you to, to keep it a little bit shorter if anybody else is going to speak? We I think I was the last maybe one. have about 10 minutes left. Okay. Can I go last? I'll, I'll wrap it up here quickly. Thank you. Um, I create jobs. I've hired 10 people and their family members. I myself have children to feed and bills to pay, just like the restaurant and bar owners. And I contract with several local businesses to provide food and other things for customers uh, that, that wish that to happen. I was the one who took it upon myself to force my drivers or to ask my drivers rather to require, I think is a better word, tips training. Nobody asked that of me. And when the person uh, giving the tips training that day show, uh, saw that we all walked in with pedals and pints, um, T-shirts. I think that that made a light bulb go on, go off in his brain, and um, I think he saw that we were doing our best to to promote more regulation. Um, I like to add a second employee to every tour, uh, so that I have somebody in the middle monitoring alcohol while somebody else is focused on driving because it's difficult to do both. I do admit that um, we have high levels of sanitation procedures now as well due to COVID. Um, and I already remarked about the porta potties that we've uh, put in place, and I'm happy to put more out there if I need to. Um, I'm the one who put a regulator on the amplifiers of my bike bar stereos as well. And those are only controlled by the drivers and they're locked in place with the key. So people cannot get in there. Um, there's some couple of just inconsistencies that I'd like to highlight and then I'll wrap this up. Um, my girlfriend and I were eating at fork the other day and it was about seven o'clock at night and we were out on the patio and motorcycle after car with loud stereo after diesel truck with flags behind it and loud exhaust were coming by us constantly. And so I would say that there may be ordinances in place, but I don't ever see those people getting pulled over. I don't ever see those people getting ticketed. And we ended up leaving because we couldn't hear each other speak. Now that we've blocked that off and we can't go down there either, I think that will help and we're happy to stay away from the neighborhoods and the areas that people don't want us. But I just, I would say that ordinances can only do so much and there's only so much policing that can be done. We've been policing ourselves. We would gladly partner with the city for additional resources and help to give a much safer ride to people and be less of a nuisance, but, but we need your ideas too. You guys are here for a reason, help us help you. In, in essence. Um, and then, the, you know, the city made allowances when my business was needed downtown in 2011, when there wasn't much going on. And there were not a lot of uh, entrepreneurs at that time willing to start a business like mine and put forth their money, their time, their energy uh, to do so. And I feel like we've been cast aside more as a nuisance. Um, and I know that we have our share of problems, but I just think that now it feels like a kick in the stomach because we worked hard to build what we've built. I have six bikes now. I can accommodate 70 people at a time. As little as a four-person bike that you can take on the green belt, a six-person bike for a family or friends or business meetings, and then, of course, our large bikes. Uh, that wouldn't have been possible without the demand that we have. And obviously, Brady, who I have grown to like and respect as another business operator. I love the competition. I've given him business and I hope to continue to do that in the future. Uh, and I would just say, please, without 
shutting us down completely. Give us a chance to operate with these new amendments and let us continue to police ourselves and make downtown Boise great. Keep downtown Boise great and fun and lighthearted. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Madam Mayor. Thank you. Um, Council Member Sanchez. Yes, I don't know if this is for Everybody. the owner or for council, but um, uh, one of my concerns with the bike bars has been the way the patrons interact with the public, um, leaning out for high fives, hollering at people. And I'm glad you mentioned the trucks. Um, I was the one who talked to Council President Clegg about shutting down that part of 8th Street as well, uh, because I felt the same experience, you know. Um, but, um, you know, one thing we've experienced this summer is, unfortunately, a lot of people from outside of our city coming with those trucks, um, not just being noisy, but harassing our citizens. Agreed. And um, so you've got folks who um, are just minding their own business, trying to enjoy downtown, and they have multiple sources of harassment. Um, so that is my concern mm -hmm. and um, my question about how do you curb that? How do you change that? So I think a second uh, employee on the bike managing things, truly, I, I feel like we've managed things with an iron fist. We've kicked people off and, and endured the, the slurs and all the anger and everything because some people were acting in good faith and some people were bad actors on the bike and we shut it down and we, it's clear in our policies. We also have a, um, we also have a, a speech that we give in the beginning that lines out the rules on the insides of the bike. We have our rules there. And at any one time, if somebody reaches out to high five a kid, which has been a huge fear of mine because I have children and kids think it's great and they see everybody waving. And we've had instances reported to us where a, a child ran out into the street and waved or, and tried to slap hands and we pulled it over and we shut it down. We shut it down and we're not going to give them a refund for that. We can only address things as they happen, but I think that um, ruling with an iron fist, so to speak, and telling people over and over and over again as the evening carries on, things you know tend to get a little bit wilder. Um, we just tell them, look, this is a zero tolerance policy. You cannot touch people out there. You cannot high five. None of it is going to work if you want to have this experience, plain and simple. And we don't have any problem doing that. I would much rather keep people safe put the bikes away for the night and not have to have a phone call in the middle of the night that somebody got hit by a car or that we caused an accident of some sort or that somebody hung on and jumped on and got hurt or got their foot ran over or something like that. I mean, there's a number of things that can go wrong and we're not, we're not willing to take that risk. So a second employee, even though it cuts into profit margins and it's more, more training and I'll have to double my staff, that's a drop in the bucket for me to keep people safe. And that's number one priority. Thank you. So we have five more minutes. So however you guys want to spend your time, I'll let you do it, but we're not going over. Um, I, I think we can, can wrap things up, but I just want to address your, your question, uh, Council Member Sanchez. Um, I think we all need to be honest here and admit that the number one problem with the bike bars is over intoxication. And I think, you know, amplified sound, uh, you know, public urination, um, traffic, traffic congestion, maybe not so much, but they're all symptoms of over intoxication. Uh, and I think people can responsibly drink on the bike bar and you, the city council can feel comfortable allowing people to responsibly drink on the bike bar. And one way to do that is to limit the time people spend on tours or bike bars. For me, and I'm not sure if my clients would agree with me, that's the number one thing, number one tool uh, the city council has, you know, to address some of these problems. So I guess to conclude, um, these, uh, we put forth a number of suggestions here today, limiting the tours, suggesting bike bar routes, limiting the amplified sounds, limiting drinks. Uh, but I want to reemphasize you know, the fact that prohibiting music and alcohol on the bike bars is going to kill an industry, an industry that's unique to Boise and downtown. Um, and I don't think you need to go that far in order to address some of these concerns. So um, I think we put forth a number of different suggestions. Um, these aren't necessarily set in stone. We want to work with uh, council to create something that's viable. 
Uh, and with that, I think, um, you know, I'll wrap it up and thank you for your time. Well, one last comment, please. Go ahead. Thank you. This is my manager. Quickly, and then we're going to wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, Justin Weeks here, uh, 9713 West Shelbourne Drive, Boise, Idaho is my address. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you guys for having this meeting with us today. We appreciate you guys putting this together. And we want to make a change just as much as you guys do. And I'm sorry, that's, I got to do this. Okay. Yeah, just wipe the with the wipes afterward, if okay. you would. Uh, we want to make changes and be a good impact on the community just as much as anyone in our city does. And that's, that's the reason you guys are probably a part of city council is because you guys care. And us being the little guys, the small business owners, we care too. And that's why we started our business here. And uh, I have a unique situation where I'm involved with the bikes. I've, I've driven the bikes. So I just wanted to give you guys my perspective on it real quick. And uh, I do manage pedals and pints. <sighs> where I see that we can have a, a without writing a ton more law, right? Without, uh, without making things crazy complex. If we provide a second employee on the bikes, that will cut into the amount of payroll we have. We're gonna have double, right? What I see being the best solution would be allowing us to sell the alcohol. And we only bring 45 drinks per bike. And the city limits a total amount of drinks in the 90 minute time that we're proposing for each patron to drink. And that in, in our ideal world looks like about four to five drinks between the bars or breweries they go in and the drinks on the bike. And how we will uh, keep track of that will be if someone gets off of that bike at our stop, then they will get a mark on a wristband. If our second employee grabs them a drink, they will also get a mark on the wristband. And whatever everyone can decide as that uh, reasonable amount of drinks in our time frame per tour, whether that's four drinks, or five, whatever you guys decide is uh, a healthy amount, we can accommodate to that because we're providing the drinks. And uh, I know I know the uh, ounces and alcohol level was uh, a concern as well. Well, if we're providing that, then we can only stock, okay, only four ounce drinks counts as a mark of one, right? And a 12 ounce beer counts as a mark too. Then we don't have to worry about them going to the gas station and grabbing 40s, right? So uh, those are just a couple of things I wanted to say that I think could really help to keep everything organized and not have to have this meeting again. Because we, we honestly, we just want to get our business open. And uh, there, there's not many companies out there that uh, could survive only being open for 12 days since March. So um, we want to get this taken care of and we're hoping we can do it promptly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we are out of time. I'm going to suggest I'll let Council Member Whitting's uh, comment as well. I'm going to suggest that it sounds like a next step is to allow Council Member Whitting's and uh, our clerk's office uh, to work on the proposal that's come before us, um, perhaps with the, the Bike Owners uh, Council and come back to us with a proposal at a future date. Does that sound reasonable? Madam President, if that um, sounds good to the rest of council, I would be happy to do that. All right, sounds like we have a way forward. Thank you, and thank you all for coming today. Thank you for your willingness to uh, step up with some suggestions, really appreciate it. it means a lot. All right, next item on our agenda is the phase two update of the J.A. and Catherine Albertson's Family Foundation Whitewater Park. Doug, I think you're up. Thank you, Madam President, council members. And we do not have an executive session today, um, so we're at 5.30. Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, on behalf of uh, Executive Vice President of McMillan Jacobs, and which is a local construction and engineering company, uh, Mort McMillan, who's with us today. Uh, we just thank you for giving the opportunity to give you a quick briefing and update on where we're at with uh, phase two of the Whitewater Park. And as council uh, recalls, we cut the ribbon on phase two of the park uh, last July. 
And um, since that time, we have worked very carefully and closely with the uh, construction company and with all of our stakeholders in trying to create what we consider a usable and safe wave. And that wave is that um, very first drop structure in phase two, if you're familiar with it. And, and again, more, we'll go through some slides here to give you an update, or excuse me, to give you a refresher on where that's located. But it's a adjustable wave, very similar to uh, phase one of the Whitewater Park, a similar wave. Uh, there are also two fixed waves uh, below the adjustable wave. And, since that ribbon cutting, um, Mort McMillan and his company have been working very closely with the design engineer um, in trying to create really a safe wave. Uh, due to a number of factors that Mort's going to outline, um, the wave has a tendency to collapse uh, upon uh, usage and could create a very dangerous situation for, uh, for users. And so what we have uh, asked the contractor to do is to work on a model that would create obviously a safe wave uh, moving forward. And uh, basically the contractor has spent the past year working closely with the design engineer and uh, with a lot of other factors that go into being able to create that safe wave, including our commitments to irrigators, our commitments to uh, neighborhood associations um, in, in having a successful wave that is going to be safe for all of our users. So what I want to do today, um, Madam President, Council Members, is just get you an update on where we're at and where we believe we have some uh, remedies in place that uh, our contractor has worked on, again, as I mentioned, for the past year to come up with some mitigating factors that are going to make that wave safe. Um, they're all models that have been created in laboratories, and so they haven't actually been perfected inside the river. And we all know the river flows adjust up and down, and that does create a challenge. Uh, but the, the model that, uh, that Mort is going to present to you this evening um, has been perfected in a, uh, in a laboratory. And theoretically, we are thinking that it is something that is going to work and make that wave safe. So having said all that, um, just want to quickly uh, give you the, uh, the presentation agenda before I turn it over to Mort. Mort. So again, a brief overview of the project timeline, where we've been and where we're going to. Uh, the work activities I just described since 2019 through 2020, all the testing that has been done on that wave and creating those models. And then what the provo proposed work activities are going to be between now and just after the first of the year and getting back into the river and actually um, putting those remedies in place that we hope are going to create that safe way for our users moving forward. And then we've, we'll have some questions here. Some of the stuff Mort's going to talk about, um, I assure you, when you see the slide, it might look like uh, very technical um, material, uh, but Mort has assured me that he's going to make that very digestible for uh, for our, our, uh, for our, our, our council. But also we've asked a number of folks to tune in uh, via Zoom uh, on this council presentation so that uh, we can also give an update to a lot of our users. Uh, Mort has done a great job in keeping in contact with our users and letting them know where we're at with the, uh, with the proposed activities. But we have asked um, uh, all those users to actually dial in tonight and listen to it firsthand so they can hear exactly where we're at and what the proposal is in moving forward. So having said all that, I'd like to turn it over to Vice President of uh, McMillan Jacobs, Mort McMillan. Thank you and welcome. Good evening. Um, my name is Mort McMillan. My address is, is uh, 1471 West Shoreline Drive here in Boise. And I'm with McMillan Jacobs Associates and I've been involved in this project for almost eight years now from the very concept when it was a gravel pit. So what I wanted to do is I wanna run through, um, as Doug had indicated, just a briefing of what's been occurring. Um, when we originally finished the construction of the project, as you can see on the timeline up there, it was finished, um, the initial construction was started in October of 2018. All the construction has to be done during the low flow period in the winter. And you guys all remember being out there and seeing the river moved over into the canal and dewatering about a thousand feet of the river. We completed that construction and we had it ready to start hydraulic testing in the field in July of 2019. And we had a very short time period before we started losing flow in the fall as we started dropping off as the irrigation season ended. So we finished that in September 
And then during that low flow period in 2019, 2020, November through January, we came back in, we did some warranty work, we did some improvements that we identified during that first season. And then we planned in 2020 to do a full range of testing, started with our spring runoff when we get to highest flows all the way through the fall. And of course, you all know what happened. Uh, COVID in March occurred. So that uh, took our, our field work where we we're gonna have our design engineer S2O, Scott Shipley be in the field during that period where we weren't able to do that. So we immediately shifted and decided to build a physical model. And with the physical model that allows us to do that same type of testing. And then we were working with the city, Paul Primus out in the field as he did monitoring sessions, getting data that we could use to calibrate our model and to help fine tune that. And basically that's where we're at today. We just finished preliminary results of that. We're working with the city to go through those. And then what we plan to do is come in in December of this year in January during the low flow period again, make the final improvements and then we'll be uh, basically complete with the project. Just to get everybody up to speed. So I'm standing downstream with the drone and you can look up, you can see Esther Simplot Park there on your left. You see drop structure number one, and that's when it has the adjustable gates in it for crest control. It also allows us to pass floods, make sure we maintain the water diversion to Farmers Union Ditch. Drop structures two and three are fixed crest. So they basically, the flows change as the river comes up and down. This is just a blow up of drop structure one. If you look at the left bank, you can see we have a fish ladder. That's one, there's a multiple things that we do with the structure, but we pass fish on the left bank. We have a spillway section that has four Obermeyer gates we can drop so we can maintain basically lower water surface elevations in the river so we don't flood anybody out during spring runoff. Then we have a bypass channel for uh, tubers and non wave feature uh, people. And then we have the wave feature there in the center. Then on the right side, you can't see it. There's a sluice channel to move sediment and debris during flood events away from the farmer's union intake. And then there's the actual intake structure that feeds a canal. Um, one thing I want to point out, you can kind of see it there. This particular wave is probably one of the highest energy waves in the country. It's uh, very well liked by the surfers. They really like the energy and the power that it has, which makes it even more challenging to control. So I just want to point that out as we go forward. Some of the other features, because um, I'm going to talk about this at the end of the presentation. We also have a rock terrace that was put in for seating. This is also a spillway. Um, basically what happens during big flood events, when we get up over about 7,000 CFS, the river goes out of channel, comes back over this spillway, back into the river, and this protects the, the bank from, from erosion. And then this is basically goes from drop structure one down below drop structure three. I wanted to show this photo because it kind of gives you an idea of what's under the water that you don't see. So I'm standing on the, the left bank, you can see the fish ladder in front of you. You see the spillway, which is the Obermeyer gates. Then you see the bypass channel and then the wave feature on the, the far right side. This whole system has to operate to deliver water to different locations. And it also maintains the constant water surface upstream from the structure. So we have water uh, with our boat launch or our, our access point there at the islands. And it also provides tailwater for phase one for operation. So in 2019, when we're doing our testing, where we basically ended up is we identified some issues out in the field and we anticipating having to optimize the operation. So that first testing season, what we found is this wave is, uh, has unstable conditions that leads the wave to collapse. And what that means is when you're out there and you see it working well, there's about a three and a half foot tall wave that everybody's surfing. When the tailwater changes, under certain conditions, that wave washes out and becomes a mass of basically bubbles and water that moves out. That's the condition I'm talking about. Um, we find that both the headwater and the tailwater conditions can change. We see uh, instantaneous changes of 100 to 150 CFS in the river when somebody shuts water off upstream or, or basically they turn their water on. That impacts our forebay, also impacts more importantly our tailwater, and that's changing all the time. Um, so we, we basically started documenting that and we're taking field measurements on flow as well as water surface elevations. And then Paul was running different configuration of the wave to see how we could get around that. And then basically um, the purpose of that field testing 
and our subsequent physical model was to, to get a stable and safe operating condition for the wave features throughout the operating season, starting uh, in the spring when we start coming down off the flood flows all the way through the fall when we shut down for the irrigation season. So in order to do that, as I mentioned in May, we made a decision working with the city that we're gonna go out to a physical modeling lab. We actually went to the Czech Republic there's a hydraulic modeling lab over there that actually specializes in wave features. They've been working on a couple of different projects. Uh, S2O has been working with them on several other items as well. So that's where we went to do the model. What you see there in the photo is the model of your wave feature. This kind of gives you an idea of the lab. It's a very large lab. Everything's a metric. I'm an English units person, so I won't go into that too much, but it's a well-known lab. Um, and they had the resources available to do what we needed to do. So in that hydraulic modeling, um, we had different configurations in the original design. We have what we call an A ramp and a B ramp, and we really won't get into it too much and what that means. But our original design flow was between 800 and 900 CFS is what we wanted to send through the wave. What we decided in working with the stakeholders in the city is we want a wave that operates for farther flow range. So we actually started backing down to down to the 500 to 400 CFS range and then up as high as 1400 because we wanted to operate longer during the season. When we do that, we're looking for a stable operating solution. What I mean by that is unmonitored sessions where we set it for the day, Paul goes away, does the rest of his duties and it runs all day long and the users are able to use it and we don't have a collapsing wave. And then through this physical modeling plus what Paul was doing in the field, we end up with that operating condition. We actually built two models. The one on the left is actually the full model. So if you go out and stand on the bank and you look at the model on the left, we modeled everything from the intake at the upstream side all the way through down the concrete channel and the exit channel. The one on the, I'm sorry, that's one on the left. The one on the right is just a model of the gate itself. So we're just looking at the hydraulics of how the water comes across the gate. And the reason we wanted both of these is the one on the left gives us the full operations. So we can look at what, what impact tailwater conditions have as well as four bay. And I won't get into this, but the reason I threw this table in here is that what it's showing is we looked at a lot of different parameters. That's the nice thing about a physical model where you can't do it with the river situation. We can change flow, we can change depths, we can change widths, all of those type of things. So we ran all these different configurations in these models so we can get a really good understanding of what's happening as we change different variables. So this is a test at 700 CFS. And basically what you see there is a stable wave configuration. And I'll get into what we basically changed with this. But one of the very first things that we did is we actually went in and started modeling what we saw in the field first. And what we found is we were able to replicate the conditions when the wave collapses. That was the, the first thing we saw at the physical model. So we know what's causing it to do it. And we actually had a V ramp of rapid blocks that sits downstream. So those are those, basically those plastic blocks that we put in to adjust the wave. And when we did that, that didn't give us a very good operating condition. And it gave us an unstable situation. So we started with that, we were able to calibrate the model to that. So we have really good operational data. And what we came up with basically is a couple things. The first thing is we actually found that when we go lower on the flow, we have better flow control, better uh, uh, wave control. Uh, it's not as high energy, but it's still one of the highest energy in the nation, but it's easier to control from the wave itself. So instead of running at 800 to 900, we're gonna be down in the 500 to 700 is what we call our sweet spot during the summer 10 operation. And then we can back it down to 400 CFS as we get later out in the fall. The second thing is we're creating three zones. We have the, what we call the four bay, which is a water surface elevation that's above the gate. We control that. Then we can control the wave height itself with the adjustment of the ramp. And the third thing is we actually are putting in a weir control at the end of the concrete chute, which gives us a guaranteed tailwater control. And that's really the most critical of all, because what that does is it makes us independent of what's going on in the river. So as we see 100, 150 CFS instantaneous change in the river, 
our tail water in the channel stays the same because our control that goes over the wave stays the same. So we eliminated that ability for that wave to, to basically wash out and collapse on itself. We also are backing off on the slope of the ramp. We found it was too, too steep. So what it's doing is it's creating a really strong wave, but it's an unstable wave. So by backing off on the slope, that gives us a better wave, more stable. And this is what it looks like at 700 CFS. So the one I showed you before was the existing wave that's out there now. This is what it looks like with the modifications. And what you can see there is what we're gonna do is underneath the ramp, there's a concrete slope. We're just gonna basically flatten that slope out. So we're gonna pour another concrete section in there. It's gonna be about 18 inches high, gives us a flatter section. Uh, we uh, completely eliminate the rapid blocks that are immediately downstream from the wave. We don't need them anymore because we can create this wave without them. And then we're going to move those rapid blocks to the end of the concrete structure, and that's our weir that we're going to use to set our tailwater. And all the infrastructure for moving those rapid blocks is already there. When we built the original structure, we have channels that those lock into that go all the way to the end of the concrete structure. This is at 500 CFS. Same wave, so it's really stable. And, we're, and, and from what we're seeing, we can go to 400 and possibly even lower, lower than that, though the wave won't be as strong. This is another viewpoint in the second model that shows the tailwater condition. So on the right, you'll see that weir that goes across at the bottom side there. That will be a ramped weir, and we're looking at make it look more like the fixed crest section that you see downstream. So it's gonna be more of a V section. So it helps concentrate the flow as it comes out. That'll line up on wave on drop structure two and give us better approach hydraulics going to drop structure two as well. On the left-hand side, you can see the wave as it comes off the ramp. You can see it's a beautiful wave. It's about a meter tall, roughly three feet, and uh, very strong, uh, a little bit less velocity coming in, which will make it a little bit easier for the users to get in and out, particularly kayakers, but it's looking really strong from what we're looking for, which is a stable wave configuration. So this basically, I've kind of summarized these as I went through there, but those are the changes we're going to be making as we go forward. Um, we found out what our problems were using the physical model and we're able to address those with, with slight adjustments in the field. And I'll just kind of walk through some additional things that we're going to be working on, but this kind of gives you the summary that I just went through. These are the three major things. Um, so if anybody asks you, what are we doing in order to, to get to stable wave, we're flattening the wave feature, feature ramp. We're going to reconfigure the rapid blocks, move them away from the downstream side of the wave, create a weir to downstream end, and then we're going to lower our design flow, which actually everybody's been looking for so we can operate later in the fall. So when I talk about um, modifying the, the ramp weir, you can see it right in front of you. On the, the downstream side, those are prototype blocks that help us create the wave. Where, the, the, where it says modified control ramp, that's the concrete that we'll be modifying. So basically this is during construction, you see that sloped ramp. We're gonna basically go to the downstream end of that. We're gonna raise that 18 inches, go direct, basically flat back into the existing slope. So that's the only modification we need to make to this. And the way that this structure is designed, we can raise the gate up we have stop low slots at the downstream end so we can dewater this during low flow conditions and get it dry to do this work. So it's already set up for maintenance that way. There's other things we're gonna be doing in the low flow season. This is just a list of those. I kind of started off with the wave feature because that's our main focus is once we get that, it solves a lot of our operational challenges that we've had. But we also have some other things that we'll be addressing. Uh, we've got a four bay level sensor that is not working properly. We're going to completely replace that. We already got the parts for that. We have um, we have a drop structure too. We have some some adjustments we want to make there in terms of how the, the flows come in. We have a couple of other items you can kind of see as you walk through there. Um, but basically, we're looking at taking the whole structure, doing a final run through it. We've got a lot of comments from the stakeholders we'll be working through to address do it all as one time and then we'll be done with the structure at that point. Something else that I really wanted to point out about this project, as I said, I've been involved from day one, starting clear back in the Esther Simplot part of it. 
Um, a lot of people don't realize it, but this, this drop structure one is multidiscipline. It has a lot of, of features to it and a lot of different users. And we had to go through a lot of different challenges to try to get it all to balance out. So for example, the homeowners association on the left abutment, um, there's a set of trees that juts out and there's kind of an island goes out in the river. Um, ideally, we would like to have moved that completely back to the left bank, got a straight shot for all of our drop structures. Couldn't do that, we couldn't clear those trees. So we had to work around that. Farmers Union had a lot of requirements for us with their intake that we worked closely with them. It set where it's at, set how our islands, a lot of those type of things. Um, those upstream islands originally weren't part of the design. We had a really nice straight shot of hydraulics coming into drop structure one. When we went to get it permitted, they required us to protect those trees. That's why those islands are out there. That changed our hydraulic conditions. We also had rock groins upstream that we were using for guide and flow into our structure. When we went to get permits, the core wouldn't let us permit those, those came out. Um, then there's flood capacity challenges. Uh, that whole area out there, we have to make sure that we can stay with, uh, within the floodway and not, not flood Garden City or landowners on, on the, the city of Boise side. The fish ladder was actually added as part of our permitting process. Uh, that came at the end of the, about two thirds of the way through the design process and it was added. And then we have a, a river access for Esther, Esther Simplot Park, as well as the fire department that we added to this. So all of those are competing interests. And I think we've done a really good job of meeting all those requirements and give them a really good recreational facility. And this is just kind of, I always wanted to give you the aerial because every time I go out there, it's just, it's a beautiful facility. And when I talk about those things, you can see the drop structures, you can see Farmers Union, Esther Semplot Park, you can see the trees in front of us there that uh, we weren't able to take out. And if you really see it when you stand upstream and look, it really juts out into our channel. It impacts the hydraulics on drop structure two when we're trying to spill water. So if we go above roughly about 1200 CFS, we start dropping those spillway gates. So it changes the flow patterns. There's not much I can do about that. And I know that's been a concern from the surfing community, but it's one of those restrictions that we have. These are the islands I was talking about. Those weren't part of the original design, but I gotta say it turned out beautiful. Um, but that changes our approach hydraulics and how we come into drop structure one had a, a big impact on us. You can also see some access points back behind the island there. There's a couple of boat ramps. So the last thing for next steps, we've presented this, these proposed modifications to the city. Now we're working through the details of what it's gonna to take to do the field mods. Um, we're gonna basically finalize that here with the city. We're gonna set up a, uh, stakeholders meeting with the surfers and the kayakers and all the users to walk them through what those mods plus the other things that I mentioned that we're looking at. Um, and then basically we and are set up to implement those modifications between December, January. The reason January is based on what we're seeing with the weather. We wanna be out of there before the end of January because I anticipate this year, we're gonna start seeing flows come up probably early February. With that, I'd open up to any questions you might have. Well, thank you. Does anyone have questions? Uh, Madam President, just something real quick. Yeah, yeah. Um, Council Member Halliburton, go ahead. Yeah, I, um, I'm going to turn off video again. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for reaching out to the stakeholder group. Ever since the wave went in, I've been really surprised and impressed with how, how much community ownership uh, has has taken place out there and regulation so it's you know people seem to know the rules and enforce them and make sure that everything's done in a real safe way and the the letter that they sent it looks like you've addressed a lot of those things and you're continuing to meet with them um i just uh, i think i saw it in there but we you were also addressing some of the the foot and hand obstacles as well did i see that on the presentation yes councilman we are when we originally built a project we grouted the riprap that's in the channel and we grouted the, the rock terrace. And the reason for that was to make it a structural section, but also to eliminate foot and handholds. In the river itself, what we anticipated was gonna happen is we get a normal flood event between three and 5,000, and that would mobilize bed load across the structure and then fill in a lot of the voids so we get more of a cobble uh, structure between each one of those. That's never happened. I think last, this last year, I think we hit 1200 CFS was it. 
But when we pull it down, we're gonna go look for those. I don't intend to grout them. We're gonna fill them with more cobbles and gravels and bring those things up. And then hopefully we'll get a decent, not a big flood event, just a nice three to 5,000 CFS, remobilize some of that bed load and give us a better cobble floor. Perfect, thanks for the clarification there. And, and thank you again for engaging with all the stakeholders. You bet, thank you. All right, thank you. I think we're done. Um, Doug, one quick question for you on um, cost and then sustainability once we get this done. If you'll remind us um, the budget already exists to do these modifications and um, will they impact the sustainability of the structure, how long it'll last? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Madam President, uh, Council members, this is still part of the construction part so that the work that's being done uh, by Mort and his team is still part of the original construction. So that's already uh, been accounted for. Um, and we anticipate, you know, uh, actually this, some of the changes that Mort is proposing might even contribute to the longevity okay. of, of the uh, uh, overall amenity simply because they've discovered some things after one year that we're gonna go in and fix that I think are gonna have impact long-term. But we're still planning on, we have our budget in place. We have uh, a team in place out there to uh, monitor the wave and to adjust the wave. And um, so far, we have a lot of lessons we've learned from phase one that we've applied to phase two. We just need a safe wave, that's the key. And we're hoping that this is gonna uh, fix that and that uh, it'll be uh, usable for all of our users again. Thank you, appreciate it. All right, well, we do not have an executive session, so we will break for dinner and we'll see everyone back here at six o'clock. Thank you.